Chapter 1 Bird Watching We lived in the little village of St. Williams, nestled on the north shore of Lake Erie, in Ontario's Norfolk County. It's a rural county with old growth forests and deep ravines filled with ancient creaking hemlocks, giant sycamores, stately oaks, and winding little trout streams. But what really makes it a wonderful place for a nature lover to call home is that Norfolk is a haven for migratory birds of all kinds. Each spring, hundreds of different species pass through the area, heading in many cases to the far north. And it was this fact, more than any other, that set me off on perhaps the greatest adventure of my life. I'd been looking out the porch window of our little house one early spring morning at the unplanted farmer's fields across the road, watching gray clouds passing rapidly by on a stiff breeze. Then, suddenly, a largish bird appeared, flapping across the distant sky. I recognized the peculiar way it flapped its wings as something out of the ordinary. Not a hawk or an eagle, as I'd often seen. There was only one bird that flew like that. I'd spotted them from my canoe in the Arctic, and seeing it now reminded me of those lands and journeys. It was a peregrine falcon. The falcon soon disappeared beyond the fields and over the edge of the woods. But I remained standing at the window a moment or two longer, staring off into the sky where it had flown. The sight of it left me with the stirrings of an idea, thinking as I did how fascinating it was that some of the birds I saw out my porch window would fly onward to the Arctic, thousands of miles away. Everything you need to know. Until now, writing and note-taking techniques were often taught without much regard for the overarching workflow. This book aims to change that. It will present you with the tools of note-taking that turned the son of a brewer into one of the most productive and revered social scientists of the 20th century. But moreover, it describes how he implemented them into his workflow so he could honestly say, I never force myself to do anything I don't feel like. Whenever I am stuck, I do something else. A good structure allows you to do that, to move seamlessly from one task to another, without threatening the whole arrangement or losing sight of the bigger picture. A good structure is something you can trust. It relieves you from the burden of remembering and keeping track of everything. If you can trust the system, you can let go of the attempt to hold everything together in your head, and you can start focusing on what is important, the content, the argument, and the ideas. By breaking down the amorphous task of writing a paper into small and clearly separated tasks, you can focus on one thing at a time, complete each in one go, and move on to the next. A good structure enables flow, the state in which you get so completely immersed in your work that you lose track of time and can just keep on going as the work becomes effortless. Something like that does not happen by chance. As students, researchers, and non-fiction writers, we have so much more freedom than others to choose what we want to spend our time on. Still, we often struggle the most with procrastination and motivation. It is certainly not the lack of interesting topics, but rather the employment of problematic work routines. Preface. Hostage to Broccoli. When Sun Guotiang climbed into the front seat of the black Volkswagen Santana on a drizzly day in January 2001, the last thing he expected was to be taken hostage over a shipment of broccoli. He was wrapping up a business trip to Linhai amid the flat rural expanse of eastern China on a mission to find the best broccoli for my fledgling vegetable company, Creative Food. His day had begun in the usual way awakening in a cold local hotel room, washing his face and hands with water from a thermos, the hotel turned on hot water for only two hours each evening, and slurping rice porridge with other hotel guests in the common room. Sun was no stranger to the rough countryside. Like hundreds of millions of Chinese, he had grown up on a family farm of less than a half acre where his parents planted rice, corn, and some vegetables. 
A young man in his twenties, he had the dark skin and small stature of many people from rural Anhui, a landlocked province whose harsh continental climate forced many of its population to migrate to larger cities like Shanghai in search of a decent income. But Sun had studied hard and graduated from the prestigious Shanghai Agriculture Institute before joining the city's Agriculture Research Center. His courteous smile masked a scrupulous mind and fierce ambition. I had hired him away as an agronomist for Creative Food only a few weeks before. He was looking forward to a visit home with his parents now that his two-week trip was ending. After breakfast, he went outside looking for a ride to the packing house where Wang Jinzhuang, our company's local supplier, sorted the harvested broccoli. But Wang was already waiting for him in a car. They met a wandering hippopotamus called Huberto, who walked over sixteen hundred kilometers from Zululand to King Williamstown on her own for no good reason. The Zulus regarded her as the spirit of their famous Zulu chief Shaka, and she was one special hippo. And when she was showing off, she could open her mouth twice as wide as her head. They visited the famous elephant herd at the Tula Tula Game Reserve in Zululand. The herd's wise leader was the oldest female elephant called Nana. She guided the herd, and Nana even gave the boys some wonderful advice on how to be great dads when they got older and had their own children. And Nana was famous for being the world's best mother. They also observed Harry Belly and Ginger, two male lions who ruled over the Manuelady Game Reserve and were the kings of their domain. They even watched the Dragonsburg Mountain fireflies light up the night sky. And who would have known that just over thirty years later, Joel's princesses Amelia Rose and Isla May would join up with Adam's angel Audrey Jane in their dream life to continue exploring Africa as the cool, curious cousins. Introduction. Why you're here? You chose to become a healer, a helper, because the world is full of pain. You might even have experienced some of, or a lot of, that pain yourself. Your heart aches for neglected children, for dying ecosystems, for the sick, the wounded, the repressed people wandering around, lost and lonely. You can see all this. And naturally, you were moved to do something about it, because you could see something else. You could see hope, potential, the little light inside each living creature that could grow and glow if given the right nourishment and care. So you set out on your mission. You collected tools, sat through trainings. Devoured books and videos and lectures and certificates. You devoted tons of time, money, energy, brain power, and love to learning your healing modality. You spent hours picking out the right supplies and accessories to create peaceful, safe spaces. Creating materials to give to your clients, maybe handouts, maybe essential oil blends. Ordering herbs or choosing crystals. Thus, you began your journey as a healer, a helper. It felt right. It felt aligned and good, and like you were finally doing what you came to this planet to do. You met your first clients with a mixture of excitement, wonder, and gratitude, perhaps with a dash of imposter syndrome. They thanked you. You saw some results. And it was awesome. 